We got comic books and comics news, comics insights and reviews, comics girls and comics dudes, sipping on some freshly brewed. Cause it's comics and coffee, comics and coffee. starting your day out the nerdy way. Comics and coffee, comics and coffee, starting your day out the nerdy way. All right. Thank you guys so much for joining us. Thank you for joining us on Comics and Coffee, starting your day out the nerdy way. I am Bobby Shortle, and I'm here with Mara Wood. Good morning. We long time, long time that we haven't we haven't been here. It's got to be over a, over a month now. I think it's um, been two months. Two months. It's a long time. It's a long time for us not to have done Comics and Coffee, but we're back um, and we're ready to go. And the theme song you just heard is is a new. A new addition, um, Adam Blotner, awesome, awesome musician, hilarious guy, wrote us a theme song. He's also working on the theme song for um, The Misfits as well. So he, they'll, I'm they'll, yeah, so he'll come up with something cool for that too, but that's Adam Blotner. Um, you, I'll put all his information in, in the post today so you can guys can check out all his stuff. Um, but he's a great guy, great, great guy, and uh, he has an album on iTunes as well that you guys can, uh, you guys can check out, uh, a comedy album. But... We're back. Good morning. I've got my got got my coffee. So a lot of stuff happened. Yeah. Uh, over the last couple of days, uh, none of it which you could probably call positive, um, <laughs> as far as uh, the comic book movie side of things that that happened. Um, we got the announcement, obviously, of the Batman Superman title, uh, which is Batman v Superman: colon, The Dawn of Justice. Uh, which is a very bad title. Um, you know, it, I, I, you know, immediately when it got announced, you know, everyone was talking about it, and I was talking about it too, and I was saying how bad the title was, and I think that can be easily misconstrued as a reason not to be excited for the movie, um, and it really has nothing to do with the movie. It's just a, a really, really bad title, which is obviously created by a bunch of people in suits in a room going, how can we best maximize a, a word order to make more profits? Yeah. That's the only reason that you put justice in that title, because you want it, you want to bring up those of Justice League to people. Um, but I think it's stupid because it's Batman and Superman. You don't need to make it any more profitable sounding mm -mm. than Batman and Superman. I mean, Mara, what do you think when you heard the title? I mean, and... In all fairness, it sounds like a comic book title, <laughs> <laughs> but I, I thought it was underwhelming. Because mm -hmm. um, first off, I'm getting less and less excited for this movie, and this okay. is just one of those downhill slope announcements. Um, I mean, at this point, I mean, I do a lot of like going at midnight to go watch a movie. I saw X Men last night. Oh! I, I told my husband we were sitting there, you know with all the, the teeny boppers <laughs> waiting for this movie, and I looked at him and was like, we're not doing this for the Batman-Superman movie. <laughs> I'm not that excited about this. Um, but let's, let's be real. I'll go see it. Well, I don't course. think I'll be happy about it. <laughs> I think I'll go see it with like a notebook in hand and then write down all the things that <laughs> contradict you know, 75-plus years of comic books characters. So, hmm. I don't know. Yeah, I mean, it's... Look, I mean, the title has nothing to do with whether or not I'll see a movie, um, but it is a fun thing to talk about. Yeah. So it was fun to you know, sit down and, 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 and chat about it when we were doing it. But, um, yeah, it's just it's not a great title. And, just, and just think about going to the movie theater at the box office and asking for a ticket for this movie. Yeah, I won't say right. that. I'll just, I'll just say Batman Superman. That's can all I I'll just, say. Can I just have that new Superman movie ticket? Yeah. What too much movie is that? <laughs> I don't want to say it. <laughs> oh no, not new Superman movie because Batman is the first name in that title. That's so, right. Uh, I totally <laughs> forgot. Yeah, so it's a Batman movie, but uh, yeah, I mean, I just think that it's it's a poorly chosen title, and I just think it, it is, it's not needed because you don't need to spruce up Batman versus Superman or whatever you're gonna call it. Just call yeah. it that. Just because honestly, one of the things that Warner Brothers has been so great about the last few years. Um, really, since the second Nolan movie is calling the second Batman movie the Dark Knight is such a cool title for the movie. Mm -hmm. And even even though I don't like the movie very much, calling the Superman movie Man of Steel is yeah. also awesome. Like it's an awesome thing to do because it's like 
people know it's Superman. Doesn't they Superman the title? We'll call it whatever we want. And this just this just reeks of, of kind of marketing. And I look, it's not. I had the same problem when they called X Men Two, X Two, X Men United. Yeah. You know, I, it was a stupid name that didn't need to be there. Um, I don't think Captain America needed to have the first Avenger put on it either. Um, they did it mostly for overseas territory, so they could call it the first Avenger without having to say Captain yeah. America because they were worried people weren't going to see a movie called Captain mm-hmm. America. But I think subtitles in general are usually stupid. Um, it's not always like that, but unless it's coming from a book, like something like Lord of the Rings, I feel like it, it's usually a pretty uh, a pretty weak thing to do. I mean, look at the stupid like Transformers, like <laughs> they have subtitles like that. It's just it's just not it, it never comes out good to me. Um, yeah. But that was the initial wave for, for that. And then a, hu- a huge other wave showed up because the, I guess it was the night before or the day before, I'm not sure exactly when this podcast went up, but the podcast called Script Notes, uh, David Goyer was on the podcast. And obviously David Goyer has been writing comic book movies since the first Blade movie. He wrote Blade 1 and Blade 2 and Blade 3 and directed Blade 3. He had a hand in writing all of the all of the Christopher Nolan Batman movies, and he obviously has screenwriting credit on Man of Steel, and story credit on Batman v Superman: The Dawn of Justice. Uh, also, is a man who has written actual comic books for Marvel and DC. Um, so, you, you kind of expect someone like that to have a a pretty good knowledge of the way comic books work, and and, a, and if he's been working in the genre for that long, to have some sort of uh, affinity for the thing he's working on. But on this podcast, uh, David Goyer um, said some things uh, that set the world kind of on fire <laughs> as, as far as um, just his opinions on certain characters and certain things. So the, the one I think that has gotten the most absolute credit is... Uh, is is the She-Hulk comments. So I just want to read them out here, and then we can talk about them a little bit. So Goyer says, uh, I have a theory about She-Hulk, which was created by a man, right? At a time in particular, I think 95% of comic book readers were men, and certainly almost all the comic book writers were men. So the Hulk was this classic male power fantasy. It's like most of the people reading comic books were these people like me, were just these kids getting the shit kicked out of them every day. And so then they created She-Hulk, right? Who was still smart, I think I think She-Hulk is 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 the chick that you could fuck if you were the Hulk. You know what I'm saying? She-Hulk was the extension of the male power fantasy. So it's like if I'm going to be this geek who becomes the Hulk, then let's create a giant green porn star that only the Hulk could fuck. Um, okay. <laughs> I mean, let's start. The, the, the first problem with the comments, just in general, is that I mean, look, they're fictional characters, so whatever. But they're cousins, so. Yeah. That's they a are. Bit, it's a little bit weird, but uh, Mara, what did you think when you when you heard th- these statements? Obviously, the dude has never read a She-Hulk comic because she sleeps with anyone she wants, <laughs> and these guys are like male models and um, musicians, DJs, and they're not super powered, which means you don't have to be the Hulk to get in her face. <laughs> right. And th- okay. And then, gosh, there's, there's so much you don't even know where to start. You just you don't you don't know. I give me a second. You you go ahead. <laughs> okay. So here's the thing about these comments, and, I, and look, they're ridiculous. Um, yeah. They're, they're they're patently ridiculous, and I totally understand outrage about what he's saying because it, it's 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 evidence of a systemic problem in the way that certain male um, writers think of female characters. Um, it's funny because it doesn't particularly uh, get me too angry, only because there's no there's no goddamn chance he'll ever ever get to touch that character, you know. So right. it's just somebody mouthing off and being stupid. And for me, I feel like a lot of the, when this stuff happens, right? Sometimes rightly so, people all, all will automatically turn to and use the word misogynist almost immediately. Um, and for me, just my own personal way I deal with this stuff, I, oh, before, I, before I lean towards intentionally evil, I lean towards the guy's just stupid. Mm-hmm. You know, stupidity is always my first, my first reaction to stuff like this. He said something stupid. 
he doesn't know anything about the character, he's ignorant, and it's yes, it's offensive, it absolutely is offensive, but um, to me, I just think he's probably a little bit of an idiot when it comes to this kind of stuff. Yeah, and, you know, granted, I haven't been stalking every single tweet that goes with this whole controversy, mm-hmm. but the majority of the ones I've seen don't side with him. Right, no. It, it's, it's like, this dude says something stupid, here are all the reasons why he's wrong. And I like seeing that because it shows that as a community we can discern right from wrong. Right, or yeah. Good from evil. We'll call it that. Good from evil. <laughs> uh, and, you know, if anything good could come out of that statement, out of, out of everything that happened on that podcast, I think it's that. Mm-hmm. That as a community we kind of like, I don't know, I think we kind of huddle around our characters that we, we read and we like a lot and shut down people who are stupid. Right, yeah, absolutely. Um, and Stephanie wrote, Stephanie Cook for the site obviously wrote a, a very impassioned letter to David Goyer uh, where she doesn't hold back on really anything. Um, and there were some very nasty reactions to her letter from people on the internet. And what I think tends to happen as well in these situations is those people acting like who are being misogynist and are being complete assholes, I think the reaction, their reaction gets kind of roped in to the the original comments sometimes. Um, and that's, I think, a little bit unfair to because there's a lot of negativity going on around and I think that you can't attribute those things to what David Goyer said. He didn't ask anyone to call anyone, you know, a, the, the C word, which I will not say uh, on the air. Mm-hmm. Um, so I feel like it's, it's important to separate those two things. But yeah. the reason it doesn't really anger me is because it's so patently ridiculous what mm-hmm. he said. It, it's obviously, it's someone just riffing, but the problem, the problem, and I think that uh, Bob sent me a link to a, uh, a blog by Jerry Conway, yeah. very, very storied, famous uh, comic book writer, um, written for both companies, written about every character you can imagine, um, saying that when he was at DC, before he went to Marvel, and Marvel was beating them, the editorial staff at DC, the reaction was, what are we doing that's, that is keeping us behind Marvel? Their reaction was, the readers just aren't smart enough to realize that our books are better than Marvel's. Um, and he mentioned, you know, that sort of arrogance, and that's the reason yeah. why uh, they they were failing. And that's and he says that it's st- it seems like that's still what's going on in, in some way, you know, on that side of the fence. And now it's just in the movie department, not so much in the comics uh, area of, of everything. But it's a, it's an arrogance and a. Uh, um, and uh, of, of anything else, and I think that the real problem for me, what it shows, is that this guy, whose bread has been buttered by comic books and, and comic book properties for his entire professional career, he owes just about every dime he has to to comic books in, in, right. in some way or another. Uh, um, and this opinion about this character just shows a kind of a an overall feeling from him that he doesn't really like comic books or the people who read them. You know, the lack of understanding. Now, if his statement had been just, um, you know, there was a lot of chauvinism in the comic book industry and a lot of characters were created just to be, you know, these over-sexualized female people, you know, for, for, you know, people to read, for guys to read who didn't have any other outlet... That would have been a fine statement because that's, that's true. true. Yeah, it's absolutely true. But he couches it in such ridiculous language, such over-the-top, belittling language. Not just of you know a systemic problem with people creating characters, but in the, he basically insults anyone who likes or has written the character, which yeah. is the main problem. Um, now, my my the, the statement that bothers me more, if I'm honest with you, is the Martian Manhunter stuff. Because yeah. this is the guy who's writing the Justice League movie, and Martian Manhunter is one of is one of the founding members of the Justice He's League. The heart of yeah. the Justice League. So I mean, his first thing is he says, um, um, "How many people in the audience have heard of Martian Manhunter?" And after hearing some light applause and cheers, he added, "How many people that raise their hands have ever been laid?" Which, <laughs> first of all, like. <laughs> Just as ridiculous, and like it, I feel like it's a statement from like 1965, you know, 
or you know, even closer than that, like 10, 15, 20 years ago. But at this point, come on. Like, yeah. I think Mark Waite said it on Twitter. He goes, who knows who Martian Manhunter is? Every kid who's ever watched a cartoon. <laughs> you know, that's who knows who Martian Manhunter is. Um, and it's just this idea of, like, if you know who this character is... You have no life. You have no life, which is a ridiculous thing to say. Yeah. And, then he, and then he goes on to say, uh, well, he hasn't been rebooted, but he's a mainstay in the Justice League. He can't be fucking called the Martian Manhunter, because that's goofy. He can be called Manhunter. The whole deal with the Martian Manhunter is he's an alien living amongst us. So he comes down to Earth and decides, unlike Superman, who already exists in the world now, that he's just going to be a homicide detective. Um, so instead of using superpowers and mind reading, like, oh, I can figure out if the president's lying or whatever, he just decides to disguise himself as a human homicide detective, dare to dream. Um, and so he says, I would set it up like the day after tomorrow. We discover one of those Earth-like planets, so maybe like we get the DNA code from that planet and then grow him in a Petri dish here. He's like in Area 51 or something, and just basically doing biopsies on him. Then he gets out and he's really angry, and he fucks She-Hulk. Now, the end is definitely a joke, obviously. That last yeah. is a joke. Um, <laughs> but uh, this idea, and this is... I, actually, I was speaking to my friend Brian um, Verderosa talking movies on the phone the other day about this, and he said that the anger is him the most about it is that it's this kind of, like, hierarchy or this decision in his brain that some characters are less goofy than mm -hmm. other characters. Like, why is a character called Superman less goofy than a man called Martian Manhunter? Why is a character who called Batman less goofy than a guy called Martian Manhunter? Just because in your mind you decided, oh, Batman is fucking cool and Martian Manhunter is lame. Mm -hmm. it's, it's just a, a very... It's just unbelievable to me that a man who's writing... DC Properties has this has this this thing going on. And Amara, I've been talking for a while. Why don't you sound yeah. off? Um, well, first off, his version of Martian Manhunter has nothing to do with the comic book character. Right. At all. And that worries me because this is the man who has poor Wonder Woman in his hands. <laughs> and if that's his idea of a good origin story for a character that is compassionate and loving towards others as well as a, a main staple of the Justice League, I'm really afraid. Yeah. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm thinking, like, what he's going to do is just going to be awful and he's going to make Wonder Woman into some feminazi going around killing, which is an offensive term, feminazi, towards women. Don't use that. Um, uh, can, can we just sign a petition to have him fired or something? I don't think that would work. Do we have that power? <laughs> I don't think we have that power. But I do think, look, uh, I, Warner Brothers is not a stupid company. The, the problem with them is that, and this is actually the problem, this is their problem and their greatest strength. Because it, it, will, it leads to great things, like, like the Nolan Batman movies, but it also leads to stuff like this, which is they're a director director's studio, and they believe in directors, and they let them do what they're going to do, right? And they put full faith in this team, and if when, you, when, they, when they picked this team, I would have totally agreed with them. You know, um, I thought David Goyer had done a very good job. You know, he, he's a lot responsible, you know, for the resurrection of, of the comic book movie in general. You know, I mean, Blade is basically the first, really the first modern comic book movie, and it started and showed people that these movies could make some money. Um, I, the Batman movies are obviously the Batman movies, so I, I would have thought it too, but now it seems like, and something I realized on Twitter, that if, if we took the superhero movies away from David Goyer, he'd probably be just as happy as we would be. Uh, you know, because he just seems, he doesn't seem to really like what he's doing. Well, and maybe from, I'm wrong, but sorry, go ahead, Mara. I was going to say, from his comments, it, it seems like he only sees me as a comic book fan, just a walking wallet who has no life and is lining up to go see these movies. Right, yeah. Which, partly true. Yeah, it's partly true. <laughs> but I don't, want, I don't want to be reduced to that, that idea of his audience. Yeah, no. I, no, I agree with you. I completely agree with you. Uh, it's it was it's a it's a mess of stuff and look in the grand scheme of things it won't matter you know uh, it's, I don't think but 
I, I think that, and I, I hate to even talk about it because every time we talk about anything to do with this movie, we get a lot of hate about it. Um, yeah. People do not like that we don't like the movie, but to me, and like whether you like it or not, this shows to me, and this is the greatest illustration to me, of my problems with Man of Steel. You know, his comments now about how he re- he would reinvent Martian Manhunter and how he thinks certain things are stupid and silly uh, shows to me why I didn't like Man of Steel. You know, it's a human personification of the things I didn't like about that movie yeah. because he obviously doesn't... He, he, he's ashamed and has contempt for the more comic book-like stuff from comic books, mm-hmm. um, which is just weird to me because the man started out as a comic book writer. So yeah. it, it, it's it's very it's very strange to me, but uh, we'll see as we go along. Um, there are things that I'm I think are very cool about that movie that uh, you know upcoming the title the title excluded. Uh, I think Ben Affleck is is a cool choice. I think a lot of the casting they've done has been very interesting. Um, David Goyer isn't the fin- isn't the writer on the book on the movie. You know he he is a story credit, but I think Chris Terrio, the guy who wrote Argo, has the final screenplay credit on the movie. So. We'll, we'll we'll see how that all goes, you know, um, as far as uh, if if it changes things out. But um, I'm sure there'll be a lot more said about the the David Goyer thing. But check out Stephanie's letter on on the site um, for more about that. Uh, Mara, on to happier things. Yeah. You started a, a column on yes. Talking Comics. Yeah. Uh, called Manga Mondays. Yes. Um, which is very very cool. It brings a whole another layer to the site, and it's awesome because it's stuff that we don't usually cover. Um, uh, one of our one of our listeners um, at Graffiti Bandit One on Twitter says, um, "What are your top manga artists?" He says, "Mine are Takahiko Inoue and, uh, and Oh Great, which is Air Gear." <laughs> uh, uh, Mara, okay. who are some of your favorite manga artists? This one is actually a really tough question because a lot of times in in manga, you have someone who's doing both art and the story. Mm-hmm. So I was thinking about that this morning. I was trying to think, like, I have to separate my favorite stories from the art that I really enjoy. Um, so I came up with three. Okay. Uh, Kanako Sakura Koji, who writes one of my favorite girly mangas, Blackbird. And the reason I like it is because she draws guys like really nice. Like, I love... <laughs> <laughs> and she has... She does a lot of, like, classic um, Japanese costuming in her stories that are set in modern day with, like, the fantasy element. So I, I really I really like her approach to um, portraying those characters. Um, another favorite one of mine is... Uh, I don't know how to say his first name. I think it's Tite Kubo, the guy who does Bleach. And Bleach is really convoluted and sometimes a little hard to follow, especially um, as you get further along in the series. But I really like his kind of angular um, approach to to drawing this particular manga. Like, it's really easy for me to follow. Like, there are some manga, like Sailor Moon, it's so hard for me to follow because it's just spazzy and everywhere. Whereas Bleach, to me, feels really tight and... Um, that really helps because it's an action-focused manga. And then um, another one, which hasn't come to America yet, but um, I actually have a Japanese copy of it that I have no idea what's going on in it. <laughs> uh, um, Akiko Higashimura, the artist on um, the Princess Jellyfish manga, which actually has a TV show. But I really like it because... Um, it, it's a it's a manga about all these women living in an apartment and they're geeks and they're otaku and they're you know whatever they they live their own life and a lot of times in manga you you see men all draw drawn a certain way and women all drawn a certain way but she does a good job of individualizing each character to where if you took away their hair you would see the differences in them you know mm-hmm. a lot of times in comics especially uh, it's the same face just different hair and different colored eyes. But with her, right. you see an, you see enough differences in, in body shapes and the way that their faces are drawn that um, you can you can sit there and be like, if you got a haircut, I would still be able to tell who you are. <laughs> so 
those are some of my favorite. And I have a new um, a new one coming out on a new um, installment of the column coming out on Monday that I'm pretty excited about because it is the manga plus the graphic novel plus the novel it was all based on. So I've cool. been reading that a lot this week. Nice. A lot. <laughs> um, and that uh, the movie the the movie Edge of Tomorrow, right, with Tom Cruise. That's mm -hmm. based on a manga. All you need is kill, right? That's actually what is this week's oh. manga. Oh, Monday. okay. So all right. I actually finished reading the novel. Finished reading the graphic novel. Um, working on the new issues from the manga that are in Shonen Jump right now, so I can give like a pull it all together. Awesome, 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 yeah. I'm actually very excited about that movie. That movie looks really good. After uh, reading the novel, it, I mean, it's going to be its going to be pretty awesome. I'm not a Tom Cruise fan, so I may have to wait while my husband's off doing something so I can go see it by myself because <laughs> uh, he won't go. He won't go mm -hmm. to see it. And I'd be ashamed to see a Tom Cruise movie. By my, I don't know. It's just it's not my kind of guy. But the story is, if they stick to the elements in the novel, the story is great. Mm-hmm. So, I'm surprised that you. I'm surprised that you know who Tom Cruise is, Mara. Well, <laughs> it says right here, Tom Cruise. <laughs> uh, and one uh, one final question here. Um, uh, Brad Pinder on, on Facebook asked this question about Invincible. He said, with the with the consistently great writing of Kirkman's Invincible books, I honestly haven't read a bad issue of, of the long run. Why does it seem to get forgotten with the average comic fan and fan sites, and I dare say, at podcast? There could be hours discussed of his books. Thanks, and I love what you guys do, Brad and Heather Pinder. Um, I, I don't read Invincible. I'm I don't, you don't either, right? I don't, and yeah. I can probably tell you why. Okay, go ahead. Um, I'm actually, as I've grown as a comic book fan, I'm more and more interested in it. But I, I, And I'm aware of this bias. I am so aware of this. But I know it's a superhero comic, but it's not DC and Marvel. Right. And I know, you know, being aware is the first step of, of you know, erasing your biases. Mm -hmm. And it, to me, it's one of those, like, ugh, it's a superhero comic, but it's not DC and Marvel, so why do I care? I'm going to, if it's an indie book, I'm going to go science fiction, fantasy, real life stories. And, you know, that, that that's, that's why. And it's something that, you know, I, I'm going to write this down. I'm going to try Invincible this week. <laughs> Changing, changing lives. Yes. Defender. Changing lives. Um, it's sort of similar for me. You know, I do agree with you. I think there is that that part of me that goes, if I'm going to read superhero books, it's going to be for one of the, the two big companies, mm -hmm. and if it's going to be something else, I want to read it from um, the the from the indie stuff. Yeah. And I get enough superheroes and other things, and superheroes that I have invested interests in, in in the other ones. You know. Yeah. Um. Whereas I'm starting from scratch on this other, on the other one. But the other thing for me too is that when I started getting into comics, uh, Invincible was already on like issue ninety something or a issue seventy something or something like that. You know, it was already mm -hmm. pretty far into its run, and I was intimidated by the numbering on the book. And then you know, just more and more books started filtering in. And I started reading more and more stuff. So I st you know I stopped having time to go back and try to catch up with something like Invincible. Um, I've read a few issues, and what I've what I've read, I I, I have enjoyed absolutely. Uh, it's just I don't think that I ever had the real drive to go back and check it out. I mean, Stephanie's told me it's very good. Everyone who's ever read it, it's told me it's very good. I mean, it must be good. It lasted over a hundred issues. Yeah. You know, it's, it's Robert Kirkman, so obviously there's a lot a lot of talent there. But for some reason, it just it never really grabbed me. And maybe it is that superhero, that non DC Marvel superhero thing. Yeah, I know that's what's running in the back of my head when I see it. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I'm, I'm glad that question was asked because it's calling me out. <laughs> <laughs> Why haven't you read this? <laughs> I don't know anymore. <laughs> um, yeah, but uh, thank you very much for everybody who wrote in, and thank you guys for rejoining us for after our long hiatus uh, on comics and coffee. If you want to get in touch with me personally, it's at Bobby Shortle uh, on Twitter. Mara? At... Mega Maramon. <laughs> um, check out Adam Blotner's um, music. Thank you so much for doing our, our theme song. And if all goes according to plan, we will see you guys next week. <laughs>